uh, let me start off. Uh, I will uh, lead uh, the webinar today, and Alla has some critical information that uh, uh, she will present uh, with respect to software at the University of Maryland, uh, both policy and mechanisms. So, thank you. Good morning, everybody, and thank. You. This is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, Again, uh, for those of you that attended my last uh, workshop, uh, I'm hoping uh, this event of, is of interest to you. Um, again, this is uh, my background. Uh, currently, I'm retired here in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, consulting in the countries that you see there uh, with the World Bank, uh, with WIPO, uh, I'm the entrepreneur, one of the three entrepreneurs in residence at the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, a big national lab here in Washington. As most of you know, as president of Autumn, uh, the Association of Tech Academic Technology Transfer Professionals. I've created and headed four offices. Last worked at Florida State University. I'm Canadian. Uh, I was a venture, uh, vice president of a venture capital company in Toronto, investing in university startups in North America. And then I've got a master's in biochemistry from UC Berkeley. Uh, that's my background. I've been in this field a long time and want to share with you experiences today, particularly uh, on software. This is what I will cover. The fact that software can be Opportunities can be found all across campus. A uh, little definition of what it is, how you protect it, and then how you make it available to others to use. These mechanisms, which you see here, are definitely reflective of the software community. Uh, years and years ago, when software was starting out, there were people that felt very strongly uh, that the idea of patenting software and commercializing it via license was definitely not the way to go. Uh, created a series of open source licenses. So there was some level of control, uh, but the idea was to share and share widely. We'll talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about the, the different forms software takes uh, so that you can recognize opportunities. Uh, this is not a talk about the exact terms of how you handle a license or negotiate or anything like that. It's rather an awareness and education. Uh, then in addition to open source, there's a way where software can be commercialized just like a patented invention. I'll address that. And then I want to close off with a viewpoint from the University of Washington in Seattle that over almost two decades now, uh, has found uh, the best way to do this is to combine the attitude of the open source uh, with uh, the mechanics of the uh, commercialization software via license, uh, doing so non-exclusively and not doing it for the money particularly, but doing it to build collaborations and networks of people. Uh, then uh, finish off with a, a few of the unique aspects uh, when you make your software available to others. So I want to talk about all that. Um, in preparing, I noticed that the University of Maryland has a implemented a new IP, relatively new policy. Uh, for those of you uh, interested in this area, you might familiarize yourself with any of the changes of which Ala will address some of them later in our today. Software. Software can be found everywhere, uh, naturally uh, in research, STEM research labs. But uh, from my experience, I found uh, sometimes at big universities, uh, there are computer centers for the humanities and arts departments. Uh, the music faculty. I had an invention at Florida State University where there was software uh, that uh, added a half tone to certain types of instruments. Turns out uh, in the Arab world, in the Middle East, this was a critical uh, innovation. Uh, came out of the musical fac faculty at Florida State University. In addition, 
there are administrative uh, software. Uh, examples are the software that drives the student registration process. Blackboard, which is widely used across America, uh, was a software uh, platform uh, created and spun out of uh, Cornell University, widely used, and other types of software. Uh, so that as you look around uh, and you've created software for either your own use, the lab use, or others' uses, or for administrative purposes, making it available to colleagues for use uh, is what this conversation today is all about. So what is software? Well, it's, you know, I'm not going to get into it too much. It's the programs that operate computers. Okay. How do you protect it? Uh, how do you protect the attribution to yourself as author? Well, you can patent it uh, through uh, Allah's office. You can mark it with a trademark notice saying copyright is owned by the authors and the institution. Uh, all rights reserved. But if you'd like to use it, then contact uh, the authors and the tech transfer office. Uh, you can protect it by a trade secret. And the trade secret protection is, I have it, you don't have it, but you'd like it, and I will give it to you under certain circumstances. That's what trade secrets are about. And then sometimes a trademark is a way to protect it. Uh, if you want to consider how trademarks are used, all you have to do is look at Microsoft and Apple and Facebook to understand how powerful a trademark uh, is in differentiating uh, and attributing the software to the authors. So who are the authors? Well, in America, the author is the creator, the person that writes the code. They own the software. If, on the other hand, you are an employee of an institution and you're doing it because you are asked to do it by your employer or you're doing it under a research contract, it's considered a work for hire. And in that case, the university has an ownership position in it. This is why ALA is sponsoring this webinar to familiarize yourself not only with the policies but the mechanics of how University has an office that can help you make your software available to be used by others. And I'll give examples. Documentation for non-commercial research campus software <laughs> is dependent on the, soft, uh, the authors and it's usually of uneven consistency uh, when it exists. This is uh, part of the unique issues around research software that we'll talk about. So, uh, Let's introduce the topic of open source and within kind of 15 seconds, I'm going to turn it over to Ala. Uh, open source arose early in the software community as a way, to, a way to share software to be used by others and exercise a modest level of control uh, to make sure uh, that the software was uh, attributed to the authors. Modifications are definitely allowed, uh, but needed perhaps to be shared with the broader community and definitely with the original authors. And the community created a series of open source licenses to allow this to happen. Independently of that, or influenced by it tremendously, is the fact that you can dedicate your software to the public domain. In other words, you can give it away. Uh, retain no rights whatsoever. It can be used by whomever. Uh, there's no requirement of attribution. Uh, and it, it, it allows this to be done uh, in a variety of ways, which I'm now going to ask uh, Ella uh, to introduce uh, to you with University of Maryland specifics. Alan? Here I am. Uh, thank you, John. Um, so to continue uh, what John was talking about, so open source um, is a license. Um, it's a license.
that requires no signatures. Um, you have to give access to uh, source code. It gives full access to the source code. Uh, gives certain right to do, uh, to use that source code, depending on the license, and it always allows commercial use. Uh, so whenever you, um, whenever you release any software under open source, you always, um, you always allow others to use it for commercial purposes without any benefit to you. Um, they may have, uh, some, some open source licenses have strings attached. Uh, for example, they may require that um, whatever derivative, derivative works you create have to be released under the same um, open source license that the original license is released. Um, however, it does preserve copyright. Uh, next slide, please. There's another notion called copyleft. Uh, copyleft, uh, our copyleft is an OS license or uh, a group of OS licenses that allow derivative works. However, they do require them to use the same license as the original work. Uh, those are the strings attached, some of the strings attached. Uh, next slide. Uh, there are a number of open source licenses. You can go on uh, opensource.org and see um, a list of them and uh, the language that comes attached. Uh, these are some of the most popular ones. Next slide. Uh, personally, for the University of Maryland, we usually recommend to use three clause BSD license. Um, it's very simple. It allows people to use, uh, to use this, the uh, software in any way they would like. Um, however, it preserves copyright, um, and it also um, and it also um, limits liability or um, limits liability to those who use it uh, and the author. Basically, it, it states that the author is not liable for anything that comes out of the use. Next slide. Um, the way to release software open source is pick um, open source license that serves your purposes uh, and save, save it as a license TXT in the root folder. Uh, and always include copyright notice in the source code headers. Next slide. Um, another type of licenses is Creative Commons. So Creative Commons is often used for creative works such as art most of the time. However, the major difference between Creative Commons and open source is that uh, there are Creative Commons licenses that restrict commercial use. And because of that, some people use those non-commercial licenses or licenses that don't allow commercial use or don't allow derivatives. Um, some people use them for software, even though that was not the original intention. However, sometimes it can be done. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh -oh. that's stuck. Hold on. Oh, it's okay. Um, there are lots of benefits of open source. Um, developers can get together and collaborate easy. Um, it oftentimes um, speeds up software development, transparent and traceable process. Um, it aligns contributors' objectives, preserves copyright, um, and you can. Um, and it's also comparable to publications for um, a lot of the um, a lot of the uh, computer science researchers. Next slide. Um, there are lots of myths surrounding open source licenses. Uh, so first of all. Um, releasing a software under open source does not limit your commercialization uh, opportunities. Um, it's not opposite of commercialization. Um, there are various open source licenses that are not the same. Uh, please read them, read what the license language says to understand um, because they're very different. Uh, it's not required to attach an open source license to every single piece of software that you release. However, understand that if you don't, then you, uh, you basically release it on, in, in the public domain um, and you, you then do not preserve copyright or any other rights. Uh, also, just posting your software on your website or somewhere else doesn't mean that um, you released it under open source uh, because open source is a specific license that you have to attach. 
uh, next slide. The many open source business models. Uh, donations, you can release things open source and solicit donations. You can build network effects um, and build your business that way. Um, widget frosting, premium, premium loss leader, meaning that you release a software, based software as open source and you can sell services or, um, you know, you can sell services or you can sell uh, additional pieces of software, additional widgets um, at a price and it's very popular. Uh, and these are some of the examples. And next slide. Uh, and this is one of University of Maryland's open source success story. Uh, so Hazel Analytics uh, is a startup that was built on top of um, software that was open sourced. Um, and it's uh, actually one of, our most, uh, one of our most successful startups. Uh, what they do is they collect uh, food, uh, food inspection data from across the country and across different jurisdiction and they normalize it across the country um, because it's very has very different requirements um, um, you know in every little jurisdiction has their own rules so if you're a McDonald's it's really difficult to compare your restaurants in uh, you know Maryland to restaurants in Virginia even and they what they do is they normalize it that way you can see how your restaurants are doing across the country. And you can also compare yourself with competitors, which is really important. Uh, so they have a lot of big clients, uh, but uh, it was built on top of open source software. Um, next slide. At the University of Maryland, typically you would need to disclose your technology to UM Ventures um, and submit open source requests, which would need to be signed by uh, your department chair or dean, uh, and then you can discuss, um, if you would like to, you can discuss which open source license would be the most uh, appropriate for your case, depending on what you're trying to achieve, uh, and release it with Copyright University of Maryland notice attached. Uh, next slide. However, uh, there are other options. The so University of Maryland has an uh, online store uh, where you, your software can go. And uh, that allows us to create any uh, custom license that you would like. So one of the examples, um, a lot, some of our software packages are available for free software evaluations. Um, some of our software packages are available for free research, yet we charge for commercial use. Um, we also sell software um, and putting things on your venture store allows you to, to create uh, whatever terms that you want uh, without having to rely on open source. Um, so if you would like to restrict commercial use, or we'd like to restrict certain use, it's possible to do it there. Other things that can go on the online store, anything that can be downloaded, basically. So we have some questionnaires, PowerPoint presentation, booklets. Uh, so basically anything can be digitally downloaded. And then we can discuss what type of uh, conditions could apply to the license. Um, I know I went through this very quickly. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and I'll be happy to answer any questions. I think that was my last slide, yep. yeah. Th thank you, Ella. Uh, Ella's invitation of questions are both during the uh, webinar today via the uh, chat and, and Q&A channel and later on uh, in her office or, or email. I think it was very important for the audience to hear about how the university has uh, set up a, a variety of mechanisms to help uh, creators of software uh, make the software available for use by others. So let me continue by talking a little bit uh, about standalone versus embedded software. It's not that big a thing, but it's a useful way to begin to categorize, categorize things. Uh, embedded software tend to be operating systems. Standalone software tend to be application-specific software. Embedded software tends to be embedded in a system operating on certain devices. And standalone application software uh, tends to be uh, free of 
uh, device neutral, let me simply say. Let me give you an example, standalone software, student apps. Most US universities have policies that do not allow the institution to take any proprietary interest in student created software. Even if the software is created for credit in a class or created on campus. Uh, there are exceptions and you need to look at the policy and, and talk to Alan. Uh, the exception is if you are employed in a research laboratory or to write code, uh, the employment relationship uh, means the employer can exercise some degree of ownership. But in most cases, uh, the institutions of major universities recognize that students are on campus um, to learn, to be creative, to be encouraged and so stand aside with respect to ownership. Uh, however, uh, the university can be approached for advice. Uh, what do I do here? What do I do there? Most universities tend to stay away from offering advice on how do I make my software available on the Apple Store? You gotta go figure that one out yourself. But, uh, this is an example of standalone software. Uh, we had a standalone software at Florida State University. Uh, our policy was it belonged to the students. Uh, one of the reasons being the pace at which the students wanted to move and get this out for use by others was a lot faster than the institution itself could move. And so it just made a whole bunch of sense. So that's one example. Here's an example of a research tool. You can go to the website here. Uh, it turns out uh, Professor Houle, a biologist, came to me one day and said, look, I study Drosophila fruit fly genetics. Turns out that rather than extracting the DNA from the fly, you can tell by measuring certain aspects of the fly wing, the live wing, that you can infer information about the internal genetics of the fly. And Professor Houle said, what do we do with this? So we talked, and as you see below, we agreed that there would be a small group of people who would like to use this, fellow researchers, and so, uh, Professor Hool and I came to an agreement, which is very simple. Post it on his website, post instructions and updates, form a user community to interpret information, and no money was changed hands when you were able to download it, but the key was attribution. If you use the software and published, attribution in the publication was the requirement perfectly sensible, made sense for everybody. And that's an example of how it was made available to others uh, without a lot of fuss, without a lot of terms, but to the group that wanted it. Uh, and there was no money that changed hands. It was simply like antibodies. You send me your antibodies to use in my experiment. I will attribute uh, you uh, in the end result publication. Makes a lot of sense in these circumstances. Another example, this is more administrative. Uh, this is the career portfolio. Uh, very hot, uh, 10, 15 years ago, the Career Center put together fundamentally a website where you, the student, could post examples of your creativity. Uh, your uh, list of grades, uh, that was available if you wanted to make it available. But if you were looking to build a portfolio to show a potential uh, uh, employer or a uh, move to a, uh, a graduate school or a postdoc or something, this was a 
platform where you could post the soft skills that you had uh, acquired, both in terms of uh, how uh, you had experience in teamwork, uh, persistence, quality of your work, so that for an interview, you could make the uh, passcode available to the interviewer to review this documentation before the live interview. How do we commercialize it? Well, we, it turns out there's a University Career Center Association of Professionals. We went to them. They looked at it. They thought they might be able to commercialize this and make a little bit of money. It uh, didn't turn out. Uh, they had a, a, another project they selected uh, rather than ours. Uh, but we then offered it on a non-exclusive basis, plus a service contract, small contract, uh, to several universities that then uh, used it and posted it. Again, uh, the commercialization was very customized and very straightforward. Other examples you see here. And then, as I say, there's a well known and ever popular methods for implementation of stochastic anti wind up PI controllers. The first reaction is what on earth are you talking about? Well, it turns out it's software that has to do with field programmable gate arrays. Okay, what does that mean? Well, it's exotic. However, turns out that your, the centralized uh, NMR machine has field programmable gate arrays. It turns out, hypothetically, I'm making this up, let's say as a research project, you can figure out how to modify the gate array, which increases the resolution of the output signals, which improves your understanding of your research <coughs> samples. Oh, interesting. Well, you do a bit of research, it turns out there are six companies globally that manufacture NMR devices, and they manufacture 70 products. Well, together with the Technology Commercialization Office, you can go to each of the companies, you can offer them the modification, not exclusively. And frankly, you could give it away free or for a modest amount of money. That's not the key. The key is this improvement could be offered. You and whichever of the companies uh, takes the software could form research groups of interested people. And there is a lot of collaboration opportunities it might even be a two-way street. You make your software available, and it might be that one of the manufacturers would come back to you and say, we'd like to have you test out some software we're thinking about introducing as a new product, see what you think. Therefore, it turns out, because of your generosity and your outreach, it might be reciprocated. I had this happen at Florida State, uh, in the microscopy uh, area at the major magnetic laboratories. Okay, the latest microscopes from Nikon, Olympus, and Zeiss were made available to this one lab to test out the very latest in a real field environment because Michael Davidson had made uh, some technology available and was working with all the manufacturers. Here is another way of making the software available and commercializing it. Now the embedded software, the operating systems, that's a little more challenging, it's internal, it's not something that you can get at, but it might be that you're working at that level of the chip and you come up with an innovation. And you may go to the manufacturer of the software and interest them in the modification. You might have to give it away free or for a modest amount uh, and they might be quite interested in taking it if it increases performance features. And again, it's the collaboration aspect that's the benefit, not a lot of cash. Then there's a whole category of software that you can commercialize like you would a patent protected innovation. Okay. Um, you can offer uh, with Alice help. Uh, the Tech Commercialization Office can offer an exclusive commercial license with performance milestones, 
The royalties can be structured as a flat fee. Uh, you might offer the next generation of software on a continuing basis uh, as, as part of the deal. Um, and I will tell you, uh, you might consider patenting it, but uh, my experience is the, uh, the legal strength, the way it stands up in court, of a software patent is still a very actively debated topic in America. And so you need a thorough conversation with Alla and her colleagues about whether it's worth the trouble uh, to patent. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. But here again is another mechanism to share. Uh, this time on something that's a little more focused that people want to pay to use. Now, I promise you, uh, as I'm closing off here, uh, to tell you about the University of Washington. Two decades ago, uh, well, first of all, the University of Washington's in Seattle which has a booming software industry, partially driven by the presence of the headquarters of Microsoft. Um, the uh, reference, the number one at the end of the word commercialization is a reference, and I'll show you the reference uh, later on in the last slide. Um, there was a software evangelist there, Jerry Barnett, a friend of mine, and he in the tech transfer office and his boss decided that rather than offer it on a, like you would a patented invention, usually exclusively with performance milestones to one group that would then develop it. Their attitude was, no, let's look upon this as a teaching opportunity to form a relationship. And so the idea of offering non-exclusive licenses was the key realizing it wasn't going to make a lot of money on any particular piece of software, but the benefit to the faculty researchers was collaboration networks. Uh, they experimented with this. Uh, Jerry offered uh, software, again, locally, largely for 2000 bucks. It was a click-through credit card license type operation. Um, I'll show examples in the next slide. Then uh, the university uh, offered upgrades and updates at a similar price. And for the recipients, they saved a lot of company time and money. They embedded the software and therefore, because it was embedded, they wanted the latest updates and that worked well. Uh, Jerry built it up so they brought in $6 million a year which was interesting and, and good because the bulk of the money was shared with the authors. But the real interest, the real issue was that the community and the faculty liked the idea of openness, sharing and collegiality, particularly in, in, in Seattle. And people got very excited about this very different approach. So, the tech transfer office, again, had another tool uh, to use and offer to the faculty uh, to make the software shareable and available to others. And I'll show you examples. Uh, again, the reference here to the number two uh, on, is on a later slide. Uh, this is, uh, a, you know, it's now 15 years old, software to assemble shotgun DNA sequence data. Okay out of date, but that's okay. The uh, university posted it, downloadable. It was offered free to academics and for corporations, a fixed price with updates available every year, extending the license for a reduced fee that you see there. Uh, that allowed the license to be used as many uh, seats or users inside the corporation. The idea was to spread it widely and everybody was encouraged to interact with the author's laboratory. Phil Green apparently was thrilled to have industry collaborators using, challenging, improving, working with his software. When uh, Professor Green went looking for uh, research support uh, at the traditional funding agencies, he always had a long list of excited industrial users offering letters of support to his grant application. 
offering to work with them, offering in some instances to share some of the costs of the research projects. Professor Green pointed out uh, to Jerry that the uh, Tech Transfer Office uh, engaged probably 10% of the STEM researchers at the University of Washington, a monster campus. I think they do close to a billion dollars worth of R&D every year. And Phil Green told Jerry, Jerry, another 10% of the faculty are engaged with the tech transfer office because we like the transparency, the non-exclusivity, the relationship building. And so from the university's viewpoint, here again was the tech transfer office reaching out and helping 20% uh, of the research faculty advance their research careers. Uh, the university and the faculty were very pleased about that, to say nothing of the local industry. I'm just going to tidy uh, this up and finish off by pointing out some unique issues. Um, you want to make the software available. Okay, great. Uh, but in many cases, uh, the software might be something that's grown up over what I will call several generations of graduate students coming and leaving. It's a cumulative effort. And so you may have 10 or 12 authors over a five or six year period, some of whom you can contact, some of whom are long gone. The documentation, usually it's done by the graduate students or the creators. Some of it might be meticulous. It might be buried in the code itself. Some of it might be via quote paper, unquote, and might be a little, Sporadic, depending on the caliber of the graduate student or the creator. This again is something that if you want to make it available to an outside party, uh, you make it available, the download, terrific. Someone says, how do I do this? You say, call me. And all of a sudden you realize the documentation is so poor that you're on the phone constantly helping people figure it out. So if you're going to make it available, making available a user manual, even if it's kind of basic as a, as a way to get started, that the user group you encourage to improve as they use it. Again, if by chance there are monies that accrue from the use, uh, how do you divide it up amongst so many authors? Do you divide it equally? Even though some of the early ones were the key to putting the architecture together? or as some of the later ones customized the software for particular applications that proved to be uh, the bigger user community. They divide up the royalties, an interesting issue. All of this has to do with thinking about and how to prepare yourself to have your software used outside uh, your laboratory by others. And uh, just before my last slide, which is a thank you slide, here are the references uh, that I've mentioned. Uh, the uh, University of Washington's uh, methodology is described in this book, which is available at uh, Amazon Books. Uh, Phil Green's software is available at the second site. And as Ala has told you about the University of Maryland's store uh, and tools, both MIT and Stanford have similar uh, opportunities where you can provide it to the store. The store will handle all the sales, all the follow-ups, all the fuss of changing the uh, following up of the paperwork, what have you, and provide you uh, with a portion of the sales. So uh, that's it. Uh, again, uh, here's where I am. Uh, Alla, it's uh, taken uh, 40 minutes. I think we've got 20 minutes left. And with that, Wendy, I turn it back to you. Uh, to walk Alla and I through the questions that have come in so far. Wendy, please. Okay, we have a question. Are uh, alum, alumni able to get help from the university to protecting software? If so, what would be the process? Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and answer that. So, um, so university will, uh, will help you will help protect any intellectual property that belongs to the university um, if you have questions on how best to protect um, 
you know, how best to protect your uh, software. There are a number of services that, you know, you could use to, um, to figure that out. Um, go ahead and get in touch with me separately um, and I will put you in touch with those services. Hello. That answers. Another question. Assuming my software architecture has main components, front-end user interface and a cloud computation services. The cloud service employs an open source package with GLP license. Does that mean I need to open source all my code, including the front-end or just the part of cloud service code? What's your suggestion to use OS software with GLP license in commercial software? Or I need to completely avoid using GLP software in commercial software? So you need to, so there are several GLP um, licenses and you need to read what your particular license says. If it requires that all derivative works have the same, um, some GLP software uh, some GLP licenses say that any associated intellectual property also follows under the same conditions, so it can be a little tricky. So the best advice I could give you is to read uh, very carefully what the original GLP license says that you can or cannot do with derivative works. Uh, John, would you like to add? I would simply add, uh it's a very sophisticated question. Al has given kind of a first cut. I think the person who asked the question should do as Al suggests and then phone Al back and perhaps have a telephone conversation uh, because we would not like to offer uh, advice uh, which might change depending on the deeper you dig into the details. So I think maybe uh, a bit more conversation would be a prudent thing to do before uh, the questioner uh, has confidence as to what to do next. John, another question. How was Washington able to provide upgrades and updates to the software? TTOs typically don't guarantee that those will be available. Ah. Yes, uh, good question. Uh, in the STEM area of patented uh, inventions, improvements and new discoveries are usually carefully negotiated. Sometimes they are included, most times new inventions are not. That's a philosophical approach. The University of Washington decided philosophically not to proceed. Uh, in the same manner, but rather make the updates and the upgrades available routinely uh, via uh, posting on a website where you could download it uh, after you paid whatever the fee was. So again, it was carefully discussed within the tech transfer office that the software philosophy would be night and the invention commercialization would be day. They would definitely have different approaches, definitely uh, consistent internally, uh, but different. And so that was the decision that was put forward to the um, head of the tech transfer office and the vice chancellor of the university, vice chancellor of research, who agreed. And so that moved forward and turned out to be a quite a successful because it was consist internally consistent that will make it available not exclusively, frequently and often uh, because the end result uh, is forming a collaboration, uh, not trying to maximum the financial return. Thank you, John. At this time, I'd like to introduce our poll and would like each and everyone to participate so we can get your feedback on our webinar today. I would really appreciate it, thanks. And while we are doing so, I have one more question. For patenting, there is approval based on whether something is different enough than other things that are patented, along with 
many other factors. With software open source licenses that doesn't exist, what prevents someone from taking critical elements of a code but not copying it exactly, therefore not violating copyright? Or is this just not really an issue in a practical sense? Let me take the first shot and then ask Alan to, to add. Um, first of all, there's the issue of attribution. Is it obvious uh, what you're doing is more or less stealing and in violation of the ethics of the community that you're dealing with? That's an issue. Then there's the perception of what you're doing. Uh, and you have to be fairly careful because if it's known that you're doing this, you're going to get a bad reputation in the community that you work with. And that's not a good thing. Uh, and then largely, uh, if you decide you want to do a patent for the software, you will do the typical prior art search to find out who else has patented something that might be irrelevant and whether your software is, quote, infringes, unquote, available patents that issued before you submitted your patent application. So it's a good question. I think uh, the reality you ask, is it a pragmatic practical issue? I think you just have to look at the circumstances of each and every situation. Most people, uh, want to be part of a community and be known as outstanding good people that you can count on. Uh, so uh, that's one thing. On the other hand, uh, there's a subgroup of people in the broader community who uh, actively uh, take uh, the work of others and use it without attribution. Okay. And it's a big philosophical discussion in the Silicon Valley and in America at the moment. Uh, but it's at a, a, a very, very high level, not at a software program level. It's a broader issue within the United States Patent Office uh, about what to do. Alan, would you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, so uh, in general, patent rights uh, prevent a method, a certain method of doing something, uh, or how you do something, how you achieve something, how you build something, um, while copyright prevents the cre uh, protects the creative expression of it. And so while there might be several ways, while, while there might be one method of doing something, it can be expressed in um, several different programming languages or different, different ways. So um, if a software is released under open source, then um, anybody can use it for any purpose. Uh, there might be some restrictions, but basically open source means that it's available for anyone to use. Uh, so you can't really protect it. Um, I'm not sure if that, uh, Lindsay, uh, maybe we can, we can talk a bit more behind the scenes. I'm not sure if that answered your question together with, with what John said. Uh, Wendy, if there are no further questions, let me simply, uh, on behalf of Alla, uh, thank everybody for listening. Uh, the purpose of today's webinar was simply to alert people to the fact that uh, if you have software and want to share it with others, uh, there are a variety of ways of doing it. Uh, the university's office, uh, Technology Commercialization Office, is there to help, uh, to talk through the benefits of doing it one way versus another way, so that, you know, three or five years later, you don't look back and say, gosh, I wish I thought about this a little bit more about how I wanted to do that. Alla and her colleagues are there to help have that conversation early. Uh, avoid issues, or at least alert you to issues that you might not be the least bit aware of, uh, that might bite you in the ankle in a very unexpected manner. And then on the other hand, again, help you further your research career by 
making available software or other creative works to others, ensuring attribution to yourself like a publication to help advance your career. It's simply another tool to move you forward and build your research career. Alla, anything else to add as we close off today? Yeah, so if, uh, if you have any questions, just call UM Ventures um, and let us know and we can walk you through that with software. There are a multitude of issues that, um, you know, it's difficult to answer all the questions um, in one session. Uh, it's very, comp some, some of those can be very complicated. Some of those could be easy to answer. So we're happy to answer that. Uh, and also Bill asked if this presentation and recording will be made available. It will be posted on Startup UMD YouTube channel, and I just shared the link uh, to the channel, or you can just simply search uh, YouTube Startup UMD channel, um, and you will see this presentation posted um, in the next few days, and you will also see other presentations and webinars already posted there. So, Ala, what's the next uh, webinar that's up? Uh, so the next webinar, Wendy, what do we have next this week? Um, so we have Trade Secrets 101 with uh, Raymond Van Dyke. Mm, that's a good one, yeah. So on uh, September 16th, uh, actually tomorrow, uh, we will be talking about Trade Secrets, which is a very interesting subject. So I think, Wendy, we're done. Are there any outstanding questions or are we finished? Uh, there's no other questions, so I'd like to okay. thank both of you for your great presentation. It was very um, interesting. I learned a lot. I hope each and every one did as well. Um, please feel free to join us tomorrow on Trade Secrets 101. And thank you again, Mr. John and Allah, for presenting. Yeah. Have a great thank you. day. Thank you, Wendy, and thank you, John, so much. It's a pleasure. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.